It is again my pleasure to introduce to you um, our panelist leader, Jennifer Markey. Jennifer Markey is a Master Gardener Statewide Coordinator for Washington State University. Jennifer has been the WSU Master Gardener Program Leader for 14 years. She accepted the statewide coordinator position in May of 2019 after serving in a county role for 12 years. She has 20 years of experience working with nonprofit organizations and volunteers to deliver on organizational mission. Her experience coupled with a BA in nonprofit management, a minor in environmental studies, and an AM and MS in management and leadership make her well-skilled as the leader of the world's first master gardener program. She is known for her strategic thinking and for her ability to engage with diverse teams to create trusting and durable community partnerships that lead to mission and vision success. She's a transformational leader who seeks to elevate WSU Extension Master Gardener Program by engaging university trained volunteers to empower and sustain diverse communities with relevant, unbiased volunteers, unbiased research-based horticulture and environmental stewardship education. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Luz Maria. Can, everybody can hear me, right? Can you hear me? Thumbs up, thank you. <laughs> I don't hear myself, so just wanted to make sure y'all could hear me. So uh, we'll get right to it. So organizers of this conference really wanted to motivate us and empower us to integrate climate change into our programming and make commitments on how best uh, we might be able to do that. So this panel discussion seeks to encourage each of you to think about how you might collaborate with the Master Gardener program or other programs to help ensure our clientele can adapt and be resilient to disturbances. As these panelists share about their work, I ask you to uh, think and remember that extension is all about capacity and resilience, always has been. Extension Master Gardener programs across the country are uniquely positioned to help increase adaptive capacity in our communities and have been doing so for nearly 50 years. We're being encouraged to think differently about our work, excessive heat, Increased wildfires, vari variability of water are all disturbances that put up barriers that make our lives more difficult, especially among underserved and BIPOC communities. Master gardeners are boots on the ground, non-regulatory next door neighbors and friends who armed with research-based information packaged in effective ways have the power to share messages about the roles that we as extension can play in mitigating climate change to audiences far and wide. I didn't print anything because I was trying to be climate friendly. So now I'm managing two computers so I can see my notes. <laughs> 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 so today's panelists represent the WSU Extension Master Gardener Program, and we'll give you an inside peek into the roles that Extension Master Gardeners play in the world of climate action. Laurel Moulton. You guys aren't seeing the screen I'm seeing, so I already... Okay, here we go. So Laurel Moulton is a Clallam County Extension Master Gardener Coordinator. She has an MS in horticulture systems, a minor in entomology, and has spent time studying the ecology of pitcher plants in North American bogs, among other interesting learning and studying adventures. She is inspired to teach climate change in all aspects of her life because of her love of nature and social justice. Laurel will talk about peat moss, peat bogs, and soils, and the impact they have, and that therefore, we, with the choices we make, can have on climate change. Tim Kohlhoff is the Extension Master Gardener Program Coordinator in Spokane County, a certified arborist and adjunct professor at Spokane Community College. Tim teaches on topics such as arboriculture, 
and plant problem diagnosis. He was also a co-curriculum developer for an urban and community tree stewards program that I'll let him tell you more about. Tim will talk about trees and how they can help communities be more adaptive and resilient to climate change. And finally, Mike Peranto is a WSU Extension Pierce County Master Gardener volunteer with a passion for climate action. Mike retired from the corporate world and comes from an extensive background in marketing, communication, and messaging. He will share the action he is taking within WSU Pierce County Master Gardeners to increase their capacity and ideas for how we might be able to increase our capacity within the Master Gardener program to address climate change. Laurel, we'll start with you. Are you ready? Great, thank you. Um, thanks, thanks, Jennifer, for that introduction. I'm really happy to be here to talk to you guys today. Um, I have the privilege of working with a fantastic group of volunteers um, that includes folks from diverse backgrounds and they come, they come, they retire at the height of their careers and then come work um, for community education and sustainable housing. So, um, so we have this amazing um, resource. Um, even without my prodding, they want to teach about climate change. Um, I have folks that, that give lectures on what is climate change, what are the mechanics of it and how does it affect our area and our gardens. Um, I have volunteers who want to teach about switching to electric garden tools um, instead of gas. Um, I have a volunteer who, who decided his thing was uh, fungal dominant composting and biochar. So those are all very direct, um, direct teaching that we can do in our community. But um, I still think it's important to go beyond the standalone climate change topics and um, and examine the sort of ordinary garden topics that we teach every day in master gardeners and find the little things that we can tweak in those areas um, to get the climate change message out to people who want to hear about climate change and people who just want to learn about how to start seeds to grow vegetables for their families. Um, so a recurring theme this week um, has been focusing on the low hanging fruit um, or promoting small, easily attainable tasks that, and that's exactly what I'm trying to do. Um, giving folks the option to take small steps uh, to impact climate change offers a gateway for those who might feel overwhelmed for various reasons in climate change, about climate change. Um, when I talk about folks that are overwhelmed, I mean both volunteers and our audience that we teach in the community. Um, for those of you who work with volunteers, coming to them and saying, I have this huge, important topic, climate change. I want you to add that to what you're already doing. And um, oftentimes they say, well, I'm already up to here. Uh, how can I possibly do that? I just, you know, because they already give up so much of their, of their life and so much of their resources and their expertise. Um, and so, uh, so that, that's an even more important reason to just start incorporating it in a small way. Um, in the weed management world, um, as many extension folks, I have kind of a diverse background, um, so I just weed, man weed management. Um, we often say that our toolkit should include uh, many little hammers. Um, instead of relying on just one big tool for managing weeds on a farm or in a garden, um, you'll be much more successful in the end if you're thinking about weed management and incorporating that in every aspect of, of farm planning and the things you do. So using many little hammers is also an excellent approach um, to climate change. Okay, so with that, I want to talk a little bit about peat moss, a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I, um, as an undergraduate student, I had the privilege of studying pitcher plants and bogs in Massachusetts. Um, I was focusing on ecology, but I had colleagues and, and one of my advisors was focusing on um, carbon in bogs and carbon storage and, and carbon dioxide uh, release from bogs. So um, after we introduced that, um, introduced to that, I spent the last 25 years trying to avoid buying peat moss because uh, not only does it affect climate change, but it also destroys these really new ecosystems. Um, so peat moss is a material that's ubiquitous in horticulture and agri agriculture industry. It's a primary component in potting soil. It's used as a soil conditioner and, and it's uh, recommended specifically for certain horticultural crops. Um, it's everywhere. 
and peat moss mining has an out an outsized impact on climate change. Um, so it's a high impact topic to address in extension outreach. Um, since it's so common, it's easy to address in small places. Um, so just as a little introduction, um, peatlands are wetlands that are constantly saturated. They have a, a very low pH, a very low oxygen, um, and they're very acidic. And so um, as, as plant material dies, um, it doesn't rot. It just kind of, well, I mean, it, it slowly, very slowly rots. And it just builds up and as layers um, build on top, it just gets compacted. Um, it takes 10 years to accumulate about one centimeter of peat moss. Um, and peat is made up of um, oftentimes uh, sphagnum moss, but it also includes sedges and herbaceous plants and shrubs, um, anything that's in these ecosystems. Um, so if you think of, if you think of um, peat accumulating at one centimeter per year, and you go to the garden store and you buy a bale of peat moss, if you measure how, you know, the dimensions of that, I calculated that that could represent between 300 and 500 years worth of accumulation of peat. And so that is not a renewable resource in any, any time frame, that, uh, any human time frame. So, um, so in terms of climate change, um, peatlands comprise less than 3% of the land surface. Other people say 2%, it's just under 3%, I think. Um, but they account for twice as much carbon storage as all the forests on Earth. Um, so, so that's huge compared to their small size. Um, when peatlands are drained and harvested, we don't just use carbon storage, but lose carbon storage potential. Um, they become a, a, a source of carbon, carbon dioxide for the atmosphere. Um, when they're drained, that, that allows oxygen into the system. And so you get real um, degradation and decomposition of that organic material. And so that's, that's where the, the um, greenhouse gases come from. Um, they, they also, you know, in these days of, of our warming climate, we have a lot more fires. And so even though peat isn't so much used as a fuel to eat homes anymore, um, when you drain those peat bogs, sometimes they catch on fire. And if you imagine, you know, those fires can go deep, these, these peat bogs can be, uh, you know, tens, 50 feet deep, you know, more, and those fires burn for for quite a while and release even more emissions. Um, so that's, that's the background about why it's important. Um, uh, let's see, I have some statistics up there about um, how much peat we use in the United States. Um, we use so much that we don't produce it all in the United States, we import it. Um, I think 27% of peatlands are located in Canada, our nearby neighbor. Um, so it's a, an easily accessible material and it's pretty inexpensive. Um, but even so, we need to make changes. Um, the small changes that we can make are just, they're very simple. When as master gardeners, every year we do multiple <laughs> ta uh, presentations about starting seeds. So in that you just, you know, add, um, add information about peat moss alternatives for those materials that you're using to start seeds. A lot of people use peat pots and peat pellets. Um, there's all sorts of alternatives that we can recommend. So it just, you know, you can add a minute or two to your presentation to um, have a big impact. Um, we, can, we can still, we can also uh, take a minute to talk to people about reading labels. We already do that uh, with pesticides and other materials. So why not spend a few minutes in the garden store and read the back of, of those potting soil mixes? Um, to find out what's in there. Um, let's see. Um, it's, it, it is true that we're kind of moving away from peat moss already in a lot of potting soil, but I've also worked in the nursery industry. And even though we bought, we imported um, our potting soil that was made of sawdust and, and fur fines and, and manure, we still used all peat moss for our, our seed starting mixes. So it's still, we haven't gotten rid of it. Um, um, okay, so I've talked about locally available alternatives. Um, and, then, and then finally, assessing whether peat moss is essential to the, to the task at hand. Um, 
there's when we talk about growing blueberries, we still recommend that people amend their soil to acidify it with peat moss because it has that um, acidic nature. We say specifically don't use compost because um, yard waste compost tends to be uh, uh, less acidic. It can uh, make your soil less acidic than is, is great for blueberries. So we need to figure out what those alternatives are. And that just you know would take a little bit of research. Um, so after you've, you've kind of taken the low hanging fruit and just made little tweaks in, in your presentations, perhaps contacted your extension peers to say, hey, in that blueberry publication, could you put other alternatives to peat moss? Once we've done those kind of uh, easy little tweaking information things, um, master gardeners are also great at citizen science. Um, and I mentioned that, that in our volunteer programs, we have people from all different backgrounds. So it's great. I don't even have to teach about the scientific method. method. I have volunteers that come to me and they say, well, I spent my career as a geneticist or, or you know, XYZ scientist. I want to do this project. And I say, great, go for it. Just <laughs> tell, me, tell me how I can support you. Um, and so, um, so for the citizen science aspects of it, it's just, there's so many alternatives to peat moss out there. It's just that they're not mainstream. I wrote down a list because every day I find something different. Um, many of us might be um, familiar with coconut core. That's kind of the, the big one that everybody's talking about these days, but it actually has some climate impacts, um, you know, for transportation and all those, you know, those other considerations. Um, where I'm from in the Olympic Peninsula, we have a great forestry industry, and so we have a lot of um, wood fiber materials, sawdust, um, bark, things like that, that we can use um, as potting soil. Of course, there's compost. You know, compost is the solution to everything. Um, uh, people have talked about pine needles, um, hemp fiber, rice hulls. Some of these things, you know, I've been, I've been really wanting to try rice hulls. If you're in California, you can get them at all sorts of garden stores. They're really hard to find here. Uh, leaf mold, if you look at old gardening books, they're always talking about leaf mold. Um, you just make a pile of leaves, you let it rot, sift it, and you've got a, this nice material. Uh, composted manure, paper pulp, um, uh, anaerobic digestate, I haven't looked into that very much, <laughs> uh, bracken ferns, uh, sheep wool waste. Um, there's so many different, different materials that we can use. But the thing is, is they're, they're not a one-to-one -one comparison. You can't just say, well, this is how I use peat moss-based um, seed starting mixes, so I'm just going to use uh, wool waste. Um, each of these materials has, has different um, strengths uh, and different ways you need to use it. So it might substitute one use of peat moss, but not be good for another one. Like You probably wouldn't want to start your vegetable garden seeds in, in pure pine needles. You know, but you might use those as a mulch, uh, an acidifying mulch um, for blueberries. Um, so master gardeners can help us with citizen science by doing comparisons so the community doesn't have to learn that each individually on their own. Um, because I, I've already, I read all the time, you know, online when people are re reporting, you know, playing with coconut core and other, um, other materials like, oh, everything died, it didn't work. Um, and that's probably because they're just trying to treat it like peat moss. So um, master gardener volunteers can do side-by-side -side comparisons, show that to the community, um, incorporate that into their, into their education. Um, let's see. Ah, compiling information. I'm sorry, usually <laughs> I'm used to sitting in front of the computer. Um, uh, master gardeners can also compile information there's, there's a lot of information out there. It's just not an easily digestible pieces that we can just hand to the public or use for ourselves. So, um, so master gardeners are great at, um, at doing literature searches and, and creating resources that are more accessible to the community. So anyway, I hope uh, this is just an example, one example of something very simple. Peat moss it has a huge impact um, on climate change. Um, and it's a huge part of our horticultural and agricultural systems. Um, so why not use that to make little changes in all the different educational outreach we do and build on that by doing citizen science. Thank you. Thank you, Laura.
We will have time at the end for questions. So if, um, we'll just keep moving through so you can hear from both Tim and Mike, and then we'll have questions at the end. All right, well, I wanna talk a little bit about, <clears throat> excuse me, the value of, of trees in mitigating climate change and how master gardeners are, are working with the general public on that. Um, it's not a surprise to anyone here, I'm sure, or even to the general public that trees help communities build resiliency through a, a variety of environmental benefits um, when, when dealing with climate change. And it often comes down to dealing with the public where they, where they are, where they start, and so we start with trees create shade. And um, here in Washington or any place in the Northern Hemisphere, if you plant a shade tree on the south side of your house, you start to shade your house and that gives you some benefits, reduced costs for, for cooling your house uh, in hot summer areas. A lot of our homeowners have also heard that if you have a mature tree in the front yard of your home, it increases the selling price of that home over a similar house uh, that doesn't have a mature tree. Now, I'm not sure that we should be working that hard to increase home prices right now. I think they seem they're doing very well on their own, but there is a benefit to the seller. And there's also the, the environmental benefit of having that tree in the front yard. Beyond those really basic facts that a lot of uh, the general public already knows, there's really a wealth of research-based information uh, available and one place that people can access it is, is this web, website, Green Cities Good Health. This is uh, Dr. Kathy Wolf, recently retired from the University of Washington and her team have done a lot of uh, searching to find places where trees and urban green spaces benefit the communities around them. And she's categorized them by different benefit categories here and I would love to spend the rest of the day telling you all the ways that trees and green spaces can benefit communities. Fortunately for all of you, I'm limited by time. And so I'll just quickly summarize those things. Uh, first of all, trees and green spaces. And when I say green spaces, I mean things like parks, but also uh, natural areas that have been preserved. Um, and there's a variety of different definitions, but basically places where there are plants that people can engage with. So trees and green spaces have benefits for human health, and that's both physical health as well as mental and emotional health. Trees in particular, but uh, uh, actually a variety of plants have uh, cultural significance, and that speaks to also an emotional, even a spiritual health that's really significant, if not always easy to quantify. So I don't want to leave that out just because we have fewer peer-reviewed studies on it, because this is uh, a lot of these are, are really significant to different populations. So used appropriately, trees and, and added green spaces improve the livability of our communities tremendously. And um, this is especially true, or maybe I should say especially studied in urban areas where people can really easily separate green space and built environment. And so it's, it's really easy to isolate those but it doesn't, it isn't limited to just urban areas. In, in rural communities, green spaces have, uh, have uses as well. So they also are um, part of our green infrastructure uh, in cities. They provide environmental benefits on a community-wide scale as in addition to just individual landscapes. And this is sort of a way that we can, uh, we can speak to homeowners, we can start with individual benefits, but then we can also uh, talk about how something they do in their yard can have community-wide benefits. So this is a, a really simple slide. I actually took this from uh, Clemson University, but it's an easy way of showing homeowners, hey, Washington cities have a problem with stormwater mitigation. Uh, uh, we have, a, have trouble with the volume of stormwater as well as the pollutants that they carry. And so when we incorporate more green areas, into our, into our cities and towns, we get better capture of stormwater. So you can see in this slide, we get more, more infiltration into the ground and less runoff here. Uh, even in places where there are street trees and not necessarily green spaces where, where water can soak into the ground, trees have the ability to intercept and slow down stormwater. So in some cases, the benefit is that they reduce surges in the stormwater system. The rain is falling down, it stops in the tree canopy, if only for a little while, 
and then later it enters the stormwater system. But instead of having one giant volume of stormwater all at once, it hopefully slows it down. Living in Spokane, I can speak to the uh, horrors of surges in stormwater. We um, even very recently have had uh, storm surges that overwhelmed the, the system and led to untreated sewage entering the Spokane River. And, uh, and we're sorry to all of you who might live downstream for, for that. So um, I, I have a, a very low level of knowledge on this. Extension is already working at a much higher level with stormwater. But with master gardeners, we can educate the general public and homeowners on the value of planting trees or incorporating rain gardens into their own landscape that all adds up to, to produce a more significant benefit. So me... Another aspect uh, is, is the urban heat island. We've talked a lot already this week or some this week about heat and, and uh, how that affects our communities. And so I won't go into a lot of detail here, but if anybody's unfamiliar, the idea is that in urban areas, we have more surfaces that absorb and retain uh, heat for longer periods. We also have higher levels of human activities that generate heat, so transportation, manufacturing, uh, heating and cooling buildings. And one tool in the toolbox for mitigating this is the use of, of trees as well as green spaces. So when we plant trees in, in urban areas, uh, we get a cooling effect that can be between four and six degrees in the area immediately adjacent to, to the green space or, or to where the trees are because of the shade that's cast, but also because of the humidifying effect, the evapotranspiration that adds water to the, to the immediate atmosphere. So we can add trees and, and green spaces to our cities. And this is something that a lot of cities and towns in Washington are already doing. Um, and they have plans to add more trees and to increase canopy coverage. So a really quick definition of canopy coverage is if you fly over a city or a town and you look down and every place you can't see the ground because it's covered with some leafy green area, that's canopy coverage. So I did a, a survey of the uh, mostly the larger cities, but some of the smaller ones in Washington before uh, coming here today and found that uh, most of the, the largest cities have incorporated, incorporated canopy coverage into their long-term planning for reducing heat island impacts and for mitigating climate change. And this is something that in areas where maybe climate change is a, is a sensitive word, we can just say we're adding more shade. And, and uh, that's a benefit that most people are really on board with uh, when, they, when they think about adding trees. So uh, in my survey of the different canopy coverage goals, there seems to be one more popular and that's 30 by 30, I think because it has a nice slogan effect to it. So 30% canopy coverage by 2030. Uh, and that's not all cities and towns that I, that I looked at, but a lot of them. Most of the larger cities, uh, right now are in the like 18% to 24% range. So this is, a, this is a significant increase of canopy coverage, but maybe not out of, out of range. Uh, and what I found significant is that in looking at these long range plans, they depend a lot on increased planting of street trees, adding trees to parks, but they almost all have residential planting as a key component of their, their success. In other words, they're counting on citizens, residents, to plant trees in their own private landscape. And that's an area where master gardener volunteers are, are already connected in and educating the people. Now, we've identified some needs uh, over time. This is a, a picture of a tree planting demonstration, and this speaks to uh, providing people who are, are planting trees with proper tree care information. This is an obstacle to success when it comes to planting trees. So a lot of people are in favor of planting trees. Every Arbor Day, thousands of trees are planted all over the place in honor of, of Arbor Day, uh, but not all of them are going to reach maturity. And so uh, one of the ways that master gardeners are, are educating people is on some of the, the common problems, the common tree care issues that, that we have that are keeping trees from reaching maturity. So one of the big ones is um, improper 
selection of, of the tree. So the tree is just not going to do well on that site. It may survive, but it won't do as well as it could have. Another one is poor tree planting practices. We have a lot of trees that are planted too low in the soil, and as a result, there's a, a stress that keeps them from either thriving or, in some cases, even surviving. Uh, this is an example of a really simple problem to solve. So we plant trees in lawns. This is a new housing development. This particular developer um, started adding trees to their developments way before it was even required. But they plant grass right up to the base of the tree, and that attracts the attention of lawnmowers and string triggers because they have to keep that grass uniform and cut all the way uh, through the lawn. And where, uh, where grass grows up to the trunk of the trees, you can see on the, the picture on the right side, uh, we get damage to the tree trunk. So this is where mowers or uh, string trimmers actually damage the bark. They strip some of the living tissue off. And as a result, we lose, the tree loses ability to, to move water and nutrients to the upper parts of the canopy. And that's why you're seeing dieback in the upper part of the tree on the left side. We also have issues with poor uh, pruning practices that keep trees from, from uh, maturing. So this is where Master Gardener volunteers can step in with online resources that talk about proper planting, proper tree selection, um, creating mulch rings, rings of mulch around the base of trees where we're not growing grass, but we're separating the trees from grass. So they each have their own, uh, their own area. And uh, as a result, string trimmers aren't uh, attracted to the base of the tree. So this is one area that we're doing some work. Um, other areas or other needs rather. Uh, this is a, a tool created by American Forests and what it's called is the Tree Equity Score. This is, uh, so American Forest is a conservation related uh, nonprofit, national nonprofit. They've created this tool where they've incorporated demographic information, environmental information and uh, tree canopy coverage into this tool where they generate a score for each population area uh, on a scale of, of one to 100. So what we're seeing here on this part of the slide, I've called out a population block. Uh, and if you can't see that, it says it's got 6% canopy coverage. So if most of our, our larger trees and our cities are going for 30 by 30, this one has a long way to go. It will probably not surprise you to know that areas with very low canopy coverage represented by the lighter colors on this map almost exactly line up with areas of underserved populations, and people living below the poverty level. So we have a problem with what a, a lot of arborists are calling tree equity or um, equal access to the benefits of trees. So on this slide, you can see that same population block, 78% of the population is living at or below the poverty level. Uh, I could also call up some demographic information that would say, so this is the city of Spokane uh, and 30% of the people living in that population block are persons of color. And um, so we, uh, we see that there's this relationship between um, uh, lack of canopy coverage and, and uh, the type of population we have. So this is their score overall 41 out of 100. It's not just an absolute score, it's also a score of uh, uh, relative to, to other parts of the community. So I think I've talked way beyond my time, but I want to wrap up my part by saying that urban and community tree stewardship training was created by uh, Extension, working with the Department of Natural Resources to help uh, educate the public and key members of the public on the benefits of, of trees in the, in the landscape. And so we've uh, done this to educate citizen tree advisory boards, as well as master gardener volunteers and commercial landscapers. So, all right, let me move on. Thank you, Tim. Mike? Uh, <coughs> my name is Mike Blanco, master gardener uh, volunteer out of Pierce County. So when uh, Jennifer talks about boots on the ground, I am those boots, okay? <laughs> Uh, my project is called uh, Battling Climate Change Yard by Yard. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that project, but I thought for this audience, more importantly, we'd be talking about how it fits into the overall program that we're trying to build in 
Uh, okay. And to give you that, we got I gotta step back a little bit to January. Um, Jennifer tapped me to be part of a team to redo the Master Gardener statewide website. And I took a couple of screen, screen grabs from that up here on the slide. Um, one, of the, one of the things we wanted to do, one of the main messages we wanted to do with the homepage was to get more people to join, become volunteers. So we thought two part argument, share what our priorities are, discuss what our programs are, and people say, all right, you align with the, you know, uh, my values align with your priorities and the projects that uh, I like to do, I'll join. So that's kind of those three boxes up there and worked really well in the priority section because on the right hand side, Paul left just to, I was going to call him out. Paul left me. I think his name is Paul St. Anthony, sir. Um, I went out when we actually used the words climate and change in those consecutive orders on a website, a statewide website, and it happens to be right at the top of the section. Now, it's not on the home page, it's on the priority section, but we do have climate change <coughs> statewide in Master Gardens. However, when you then start talking about our programs, um, you run into what I'm sure you guys are familiar with an extension, which is uh, extension's greatest strength is its distributed nature within every county. And so that's great because we can have boots on the ground, we can be engaged with our local communities, but it's also our greatest weakness when it comes to communicating what we do, because it becomes very hard to say one thing that spans all of the counties. And so when we were putting together programs, I'd be madly writing up all the programs we have. Jennifer would be editing the hell out of my document because it did, was, I was chaining and peers to two largest counties. We don't do all that stuff in other counties. And going through that process, any backup on climate change, any further depth has disappeared because we couldn't point to a climate change program that was relevant across the state. So we wrapped up the website project in March. I went back to focusing on Pierce County stuff. We had a new coordinator there. And I sat down with her and said, climate change is important to me. And I wanted to start a program in Pierce County. She got behind it completely. And so we've been trying to be pretty careful in how we launch that program off. The first project that we're doing is this battling climate change yard by yard. So what we're trying to do with this is have a something that goes to Master Gardener core competencies, right? Master Gardener started helping homeowners with their garden questions. So we focus on the yard, the, home, the suburban homeowner's yard, right? Um, simply breaking it down into lawn, beds, and we put in a little bit for growing veggies, okay? Um, but we want it to be as accessible as possible. We don't want to turn anybody off. We want to get as many people to the presentation as possible. So a lot of the climate change presentations talk about getting rid of your lawn. Well, especially in Western Washington, that ain't going to happen anytime soon. So we'd much rather spend our time telling people how they can reduce the carbon inputs and in maintaining the lawns and maintaining the lawns in a climate friendly way rather than telling people to rip up their lawns. Okay. When you get to the, the beds portion, that's a chance to we introduce our ultimate photosynthesis and educate people on building quality soil and how you can have your, your tea tier, your tree tier, your shrub tier, your ground cover tier, and orient everything so that you capture as much possible, as much of the sun's rays as possible and turn it into the good stuff that goes back into the soil. We'll go that far, but what we won't do is jump into a specific bed design like a pollinator garden. Why? Because we have dozens of other pollinator garden presentations throughout the website. And what we'd rather do is have this be the foundational presentation people go through, and then we'll put through the other presentations to we'll make sure that they've been updated with climate change relevant information. But It'll be the landing point for this presentation for our multiple, multiple presentations attached to it. Okay. And then the last piece of it, returning to the uh, approachability part of it, 
We want to have a, a PDF workbook. A lot of people listen to these presentations, they get excited, they take lots of notes, they go home and then they move the notes. So the thought being, if you can just have a PDF with one page on it that's clickable, that has down the left-hand column, your, your lawn, your beds, your veggie garden, and across your by month, it becomes your little workbook that you can click on. And when you click on it, you sell a thing, it will then tell you when to do it, what to do, and why you're doing it. So that, that's going to be the lead behind for this little project. So that's what we're working on. Um, uh, put, put together a little team. And, uh, we also specifically recruited a new set of volunteers, the interns. So it's an interim project because we wanted to start growing little uh, climate change experts in, uh, in that, that can deliver the presentation. Uh, the hope being that many people want to see it. And now in the Zoom wide world, we don't have to just stay within the boundaries of Harris County. We can tape it and it can, it can go at least Western Washington wide. So that's the project. I have one more slide. Um, and I've kind of early lessons on the project. I think I thought we get two great. I, I put this presentation together, you know, a week before I came here. But these were great insights. And I came in yesterday and started listening. And, and you guys are kind of on this stuff. And being here, I, I learned that you're on it. But I'll still mention them anyway, which is uh, putting together projects like this. The, the networking is one of the challenging things. So you guys are already talking about networking. It really helps. I would just incur, I would suggest you not only think top down networking, but also when you get out to the, the boots on the ground, make it easier for us to network for me to find other people that are interested in climate change. Because I don't need a lot of help, but I don't need a lot of top down guidance. But if I had other partners, we could, you know, work all together and we can get more stuff done more quickly. The other one was I, th I kind of. That is really an idea, and I, I was in love with it because I was, I was going to ask for peer review at wsu.edu. If you know, alliteration at all, oh, maybe I, I thought that was going to be the highlight, and I told Jennifer about it. Turns out she's already working on it, but I'll still bring it back up, which is when you're working on climate change kind of stuff, we are, Master Gardeners, we would dearly love to get our stuff peer reviewed, okay? And the easier and more transparent we can make that process, the better, the more rapidly that we can proceed. And so if there's anybody out here in the audience who has the knowledge and skill sets that can be on that peer reviewing side, please volunteer. Um, if you're worried that we're going to inundate you with too much stuff, don't, because um, there will be a lot of activity, but the way it works, or the way I understand it to work is I have you know, for small like me can get anything peer reviewed, I got to go to my coordinator, make my case, and then she has to make her case to Jennifer. And, and for you guys, I think that's the real value because I talked earlier that the greatest strength of, of our organization being county centric is also its greatest weakness. If you had a device where you said, look, anything that's peer reviewed when we put on the state website, you're going to have all the people who want the stuff peer reviewed submitting, but then people like Jennifer and her peers can select projects that fit into overall programs. And you can more rapidly knit together richer programs that can span the state. So that's it. That's my two pieces worth. We got we're over only two minutes past time. So. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Well, I just have a, a few closing words here um, that I wanted to mention. So when, when building this deck and working with these panelists, but before I had the opportunity to be enlightened by everything, all the speakers at this conference, the, the concept of change management struck me. And the fact that climate change, change. Well, change by nature is very scary for us people, us humans, right? Um, it threatens our known human existence. We don't know what's coming next or where we're going to fit in what's coming next or what our purpose will be in what is coming next. So when we look at successful change management and the research behind successful change management, it requires a holistic approach that shows people where they're going to fit in the future. 
And, uh, you know, our speakers thus far have done, I think, a fantastic job of encouraging us to take action and have ensured us that it's absolutely okay to be in the mess. Like, we don't really know what we're doing, but we have the science that will help us understand how to move forward. So figuring out the role that Extension has to play in communicating and teaching about climate change. So I think um, it was either Jennifer or Heidi, I can't remember which one, said this is an exciting time. So I think this conference is a step toward taking a look at the role, right, that WSU Extension is playing in climate change with a holistic view. We're attempting to know and understand the variety of ways climate impacts our natural environment, our individual community and worldwide health and well-being. Extension has a huge breadth of subject matter expertise, youth and families, community economic development, crops and soils, water conservation uh, and quality, animal health, natural resources, and everything in between. Extension Master Gardeners have been cultivating plants, people, and communities since 1973. It has always been about a healthy people and a healthy planet. The tools exist when, within Extension already to take action um, on climate change. It's a matter of collaborating, working together, and repackaging our programming to communicate that what we do has the potential to impact climate so that we all understand the role that we're playing to mitigate the impact of that change and to give tools to individuals and communities so that they feel empowered and ready to defend against the disturbances, to be more adaptive, and to be more resilient. So one other thing, uh, Heidi said yesterday, some folks don't want to hear it from her. She's the stuffy academic, right? So perhaps those folks that don't want to hear it from Heidi would be willing to hear it from a WSU Extension Master Gardener or an Extension Master Gardener across the nation. So with that, I encourage you to think about how your programs might collaborate with Extension Master Gardener programs. There are 4,500 in our state, 4,500 Extension Master Gardeners in our state, 85,000 Extension Master Gardeners across the nation. They are an army of message carriers ready to send the message that you all want them to send. So they can, with uh, well-packaged information, publications, fact sheets, volunteers are ready to help create those. You know, we can really make a difference in extension, within extension on climate change. Thank you to Tim, Laurel, and Mike for being here. Thanks for listening to us today. Any questions? Yeah. Is there a box? <laughs> so, um, one of the most successful one of the most successful uh, projects that we've had in our county, as Laurel well knows, because she helped to orchestrate it with Master Gardeners, was. Um, some citizen science that a group of master gardeners uh, conducted uh, along roadsides that then led to them acting as advisors to our noxious weed board and our public works department to get an ordinance changed at the county level for how weeds are managed along roadsides. So that's an example of master gardeners really working to affect policy change uh, and I wanted to ask the panelists, you as well, Jennifer, what opportunity do you see for our master gardeners, um, volunteers? Many of you gave examples of how um, there's education and outreach happening to help people change their individual behaviors. I'm wondering if you see um, opportunities in this realm with climate change to, to think about how master gardener, this army of, of master gardener volunteers can affect policy change, either at the county level, the state level, the federal level. One of the, one of the things that I, I, I kind of glossed over it, but the, the urban and community tree stewards training, the idea behind that came from the DNR and 
what they wanted was to expand tree education and expand a core of advocates for trees and tree care. And so that part of our role there is create, help to create a curriculum that could educate people to be more effective advocates. And so uh, one of the things that, that Master Gardeners can do is take that as continuing education so that then we're hopefully advancing their knowledge. Uh, I think, uh, at least in Spokane, we haven't always really advocated for policy change because we were leery of, of where is the line for what we can do as advocates and, and where are we lobbying. And so a lot of our volunteers, uh, at least in Spokane, tend to be people who are more environmentally aware, but a little nervous about advocate, advocating for environmental issues surrounded by uh, uh, people who may not who may view climate change as a dirty word or environment as a, as a, uh, a resource instead of a, uh, to be uh, exploited. So I'm babbling now, I apologize. But uh, more of our role has been in, in education and trying to improve people's knowledge so that they can advocate, I guess, is that. Yeah, I would agree. So it's, um, we've been very clear with Master Gardener volunteers that, you know, they are under the same rules that we are in terms of you know, where, is, where are we educating and where are we lobbying and where is that line? And it's really difficult to um, find that line, especially when you're communicating it to potentially 400 master gardeners in Pierce County, 600 in King County. So we tend to draw those lines pretty bright <laughs> in the volunteer program. Um, but so it's really about edu education and, and teaching our public so that they can understand the importance of these issues. Thank you for that. I want to clarify that by no means do I mean lobbying because I'm very well aware of the limitations that we have. But uh, using our science-based research at the local level to help um, decision makers uh, inform policies, I think is an opportunity for, for MasterCard, particularly in the market. I would agree. I would agree. Thank you. I was going to say, along with that, even though it's not policy change, um, I, we, we could help with policy with our roadside weed management monitoring. But with, um, you know, with the peat moss initiative, if we're doing citizen science comparing different options to replace peat moss, we have personal relationships with nurseries um, and other agricultural products providers. And so we can kind of you know, we have to be careful about advocacy, but we can use those personal relationships to say, hey, would you consider carrying, you know, this product as an alternative or, or carrying fewer peat products or, you know, something like that. So um, in addition to influencing policy, we can also work our, our grassroots networks. Thanks, Carol. So I have a question about how we're thinking about extension with respect to certain kinds of businesses. So is there a way to think about master gardeners as helping to helping next generation uh, landscapers uh, to get into the business or thinking about how you could have a training session for landscapers about you know, mulching electric lawnmowers to increase water infiltration to reduce extreme, you know, weather events or reducing the nitrogen use in grasses or thinking about grasses that don't need things or just moving away from like the individual to individual to the individual to the business that deals with many individuals like landscapers. And then the other idea is in New York State, we're thinking about afforestation of one to four million acres of quote unquote idle lands. Um, and what we see is a supply chain problem with seedlings and seedling stocks and choosing of those species. And it just strikes me that there's a way in which, uh, I, I mean, I'm astounded that there are 85,000 master gardeners. And I think it'd be, there's a real leveraging opportunity here to maybe even having some kind of innovation hubs for landscapers and for supply chain um, 
for crops and I, I mean, not crop species and things like that. So um, historically and uh, master gardener volunteers are only allowed to teach individuals. Allowing master gardener volunteers to move into the commercial realm is um, not something that our program does. We really focus on, on the individual. However, I do know that in some cases where there are our faculty, faculty oversight of a master gardener program, master gardener volunteer, they can engage with landscapers, um, land, you know, other uh, businesses, and they have taught in that way. Um, I think Tim probably does some of that in Spokane County. Um, so, and I, I can't speak to other states, right? So it kind of depends on what is available uh, faculty-wise in the, in the counties, in, in the individual states, and how the Master Gardener program in the other states is, is managed and organized. And two comments, two add-ons. Everything she said, but however, in climate change yard by yard, we're going to encourage people that have yard services to start challenging their yard service providers to ditch the gas powered. Uh, probably you don't start with the mower, you probably start with the edgers and the blowers, but so, so bottom up pressure that way, that was one. Um, to your other question about the um, supply chain issues, uh, there are, a, so in the state of Washington, 4,500 active master gardeners and a number of them have greenhouses. Right now, most of that excess greenhouse space is being used to start plants for our plant sales, which is our primary funding activity. But if we had a program that we could get behind a program for supplying trees and stuff like that, I, I, we have the infrastructure to do it. We just have to have a good idea. Um, I, I was going to say, even though master gardener volunteers are not allowed to advise uh, folks that are making money off of their, you know, landscapers or farmers, um, we can use the training to to train those groups of people. And in Clallam County, for example, um, uh, one of the local tribes, the Jamestown Clallam tribe, their uh, landscape manager would send all his new employees through the master gardener program. Um, and at the time, it was we it was kind of problematic because when you go through the Master Gardener program, you're supposed to give back to the community by volunteering. And we would have these people go through and they were instructed to say, oh yeah, yeah, I'm gonna volunteer. And then they would just leave. But but in the in the grand scheme of things, it was a great thing because they were getting a sustainable gardening education. Um, and so we didn't get the volunteers, but we still got a community benefit. And we have other things like our, our home horticulture class that was, you know, it's basically the master gardener training without needing to do the volunteer service. And anybody can take that. And, and landscapers do take that training. Um, in some counties, you can you can take the master gardener training and pay a little bit more just to do it as a professional and not do the volunteer work. So um, so in some places we are we are reaching. The, the landscaping community. Um, in some cases, in, in our county, a lot of the farm, farmers that I work with are very, very small farmers, and they're kind of, you know, it's like, where does the gardening stop and the farm start? That's just how we do it where we are. And so, in some cases, master gardeners can reach the farming community. community. Um, and I think we could use that, that resource even more. Mm -hmm. Tim, do you have anything to add? Uh, well, I would I'd say too that uh, our, our online training for urban and community tree stewards reaches a certain number of landscapers and entry level arborists. Uh, we intended it for volunteers, uh, master gardeners and, and uh, municipal tree boards, but we found it's also an opportunity for professional development for some people who are just entering the green industry. So that might be one way that we could even leverage as we, as we uh, hopefully um, review and update that in the future. We're running out of time, Perfect. but we're all going to be here so we can all continue the conversation. We're going to have a 15 minute break. So please be by 10 30. And again, our panelists are available for all of you.